Canada. Je suis votre hôte de salle. Je m'appelle Lynn Lee et je travaille pour Parks Canada. I will be moderating your session today. Je serai le moderateur de la séance d'aujourd'hui. I would like to introduce the chair of this session who will be leading us through today's presentation. Please welcome Anna Spalding to the stage. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks everyone, and I think if it, there's quite a lot of people, so if it gets stuffy, we can keep that door open, I'm okay with doing that, um, maybe. Um, okay, so welcome, welcome to our session, our session on mainstreaming equity in marine protected areas, uh, a global outlook and local perspectives. Um, so my name is Anna Spaulding. I'm a Nexus, Ocean Nexus PI. I'll talk about what Ocean Nexus is. And I'm also um, an associate professor at Oregon State University and affiliated with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Our session today, we're really trying to, aim, trying to address some of the topics that have been talked about a lot in the conference so far, in the Congress so far, as well as over the past years, everyone I'm sure is hearing the word equity, equity, social equity, and to the point of you know, questioning what, what does it mean, how do we do it, what are the goals of, of trying to uh, consider equity in, in conservation and marine protected areas specifically. As a research group, um, Nexus is sort of looking at equity globally, um, so trying to come up with frameworks and processes and procedures and way to, ways to think about equity from a global perspective and using local examples. So today, specifically, we're going to show some local examples from some of our Nexus partners on how you know how to do it, and I'm sure some of or many of you are interested in how to do it. As I see the room increasing in number of people, <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about that global vision, what it looks like locally, and provide some examples. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce what Ocean Nexus is, um, and I must admit I'm biased. It is a place where I absolutely feel comfortable from my academic perspective, as well as from friendships and from like-minded um, perspectives on, on how to achieve um, you know, better MPAs for people as well as for nature. Uh, so personally, some of the work that I do, which I'm not gonna present today, is <laughs> thinking about <laughs> how MPAs, right, what are we trying to protect? What are we trying to protect when we think about um, conservation and, and for whom are we trying to conserve uh, things? So I brought, this in, I brought this up at a meeting yesterday, um, and I think that we need to be aware that when we say that people are the threat to natural resources, uh, there is also climate and biodiversity loss, which are threats to natural resources, are also threats to people. So part of the conversation today, I hope, will sort of lead us to think on how we can use MPAs or any other conservation tool to also protect people. Um, so recognizing that inequities and also aiming to dismantle those inequities and you know maybe raise the question are MPAs a way to do that right can we use MPAs as a tool to dismantle some of the inequities and in the ways in which climate change biodiversity loss and also these um, affiliated crises are affecting humans today so let's see ocean nexus the mission is to establish social equity at the center of ocean governance um, there are over a hundred members um, of interdisciplinary scholars and practitioners. It is funded by the Nippon Foundation at 3.2 million per year. Uh, it's a 10-year commitment um, at the moment. And it is based at the University of Washington in Earth Lab. Um, and that's where the program office is. And there are partners from over 30 universities. So when I said I was a PI, Oregon State is one of those partner universities institutions. And there are deputy directors of science, and two of the deputy directors are here. <laughs> um, and one is at Dalhousie, and one other of the deputy directors is at uh, Edinburgh University, but we have uh, Simon Fraser and Victoria, University of Victoria here as deputy directors. Um, and our Ocean Nexus director as well, Yoshi, is gonna talk a little bit as well. Um, so the research that is carried out by Ocean Nexus is talking about impacts and risk of marine intervention. So for instance, MPAs would be considered an intervention. Sovereignty, seafood sovereignty, equity and justice in the blue economy, community well-being and fisheries, which are very common topics, but again, what's centered through all of those topics is the question of equity. And there on the graph you can see 
the, sort of the distribution of that. Uh, I'm hoping the protected areas will be a growing piece of that pie. <laughs> That's maybe because I'm leading that section. But <laughs> um, hopefully we will um, grow that and encourage folks to join sort of these questions of equities and, and MPAs. Um, and then this is just a graph. There's no way you can look at it or read the specifics, but you can get a sense of the global distribution of the Nexus project so far. Um, and we are in year four. Five of the four of the ten-year commitment, year four of the ten-year commitment. So there are lots and lots of opportunities to continue to expand this work, and I see lots of the Nexus fellows um, in the room here as well, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, Nexus fellows, you want to raise your hand? Those of you who are participating, Nexus. Oh, you're all here. I love it. You're a strategic advisor, you know. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so this is. Um, and so if you want to follow us on Twitter, there's also a website if folks want to follow some of the activities that we do. So today's uh, presenters, first I want to introduce our Nexus Director, uh, Dr. Yoshi Ota, um, and he's based at the University of Washington. And he'll take us through ocean equity, some of the definitions and some of the approaches that the group Ocean Nexus uses. And then the next um, four speakers, five speakers, um, are going to give us, as I said, specific examples of what that looks like, both from the Nexus perspective globally and then as well as the local examples um, of what that, of, of how we apply that thinking to local case studies. And then um, Deputy Director Andres Cisneros Montemayor will uh, lead a discussion and hopefully you all have an opportunity to participate as well. Okay. Yeah. okay, so everybody can hear me okay, back over that. Um, thank you for the response. Um, so my name is Yoshi Ota. I'm a director of Ocean Nexus. Um, the Pong Foundation Ocean Nexus Center is proper name. Um, and I'm also professor of practice at School of Marine and Environmental Affairs in University of Washington. Um, so about 15 years ago, no, it's 2011, so it's like uh, 12 years ago. Um, I came to Vancouver to run a scientific program called Ordinaries Program, and there's few people who are participating in that. And it was kind of like an interdisciplinary program, program to project future ocean, you know, we kind of like trying to predict with a different expertise, climate change, biodiversity, law, you know, so on and so forth. Many universities, Cambridge, Duke, Princeton, Stockholm, um, UBC, they were all part of it. And we spent about like a nine years trying to kind of like model it, predict it, address it, you know, consider what the future ocean would look like. And we came up with two very simple messages. It's just 200 papers, so it wasn't really that simple. But I was a director, and then I have to come up with you're kind of like a, a, a take home message after nine years, but not so complicated. And one was the impact of the climate change, um, global environmental change would actually um, work negatively to ocean sustainability, and nobody argued with that in this room, I believe. But around 2011, there was like a different voices and different perspectives, and we looked at many different aspects from fisheries, to biodiversity, extreme event, mismatch of the ecological um, uh, trophic relationship. Just look at many of different parts of it. And, but anywhere you look, there was just a really not good news at all. And now everybody knows about it. The second um, thing that I, um, uh, I got it as a message for the after nine years was really the disparity between those who benefit from the ocean and those who don't will become wider in the future. There are many reasons for it. The resource itself will become smaller. And when people perceive resources getting smaller, unfortunately not everybody is thinking, let's share equally, but they're trying to hold on to their piece of the pie. And then that will really kind of bring much more inequality in terms of opportunity um, and resource sharing and a benefit, so and so forth. So the disparity part, the second one, first one, a lot of people working on it, I believe. And the second part of the disparity was what we're concerned about. We need to do something about this. We need to bring 
academic and the researchers and the network and capacity building to really close this disparity. Otherwise, if we have a wonderful ocean but there's only one or two very rich people enjoying it, that ocean, I don't really think that's a good ocean. I don't want that more sadly. And surely the people in this room do not want that. So that's where this nexus, the idea about, let's think about social equity in ocean governance. Ocean governance is a bit funny word, so I'll talk more about like, the governance of the oceans, you know, really looking into the accountability, you know, legitimacy, responsibility, transparency, those are really important part of the governance. So that's really where Nexus actually came from. And first three years we have spent, or we really struck. What do we mean by equity? <coughs> It's a quite difficult time. And by the way, last week we had the first <coughs> workshop with 30 of our colleagues and the fellows. And then I asked them to just tell me what do you think what equity is, as if you're telling seven years old. And I'm just going to share a few of those. You know, equity is when we share things with our friends in a way that is fair. Fair enough. <laughs> equity, if I have 10 candidates to give away to you and your brother, you would want the same amount of candy. I should not give more to your brother because he is bigger and an older than you. <laughs> Pretty good, right? <coughs> Equity. How you and your friend can have the same access to food, games, family. Family? Okay, right. <laughs> and this is, this is the best one. Equity is the opposite condition of inequity. <laughs> there you go. Now, let me just get a little bit, sort of like, a, you know, what I study. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you, Anna. You have to press it with those. Okay, Sorry. so I look around and read along, and everybody gets confused about equity is process and the outcome. Have you ever heard about this? Process and the outcome. It's just so confusing. What does that mean, really? But. The easiest way to really looking into equity is what's the difference between equality and equity? And you guys probably seen one of those so like a baseball stuff with the kids and, and all this, but there is a work which has been done by Harvard professor. I'm not saying Harvard is the best place ever, but uh, um, Harvard professor Martha Miller. And she was really looking at the difference between equity and equality. She was looking at equality more about like giving the same opportunity. Equity is make sure everybody uh, there is no variance between disadvantage and advantage. Equality is really looking to um, uh, the, the classification of the different groups but have uh, the same resource. Um, equity is really to make sure the process to achieve the equal amount of opportunity of the resource is secured, protected, and really considering about the people which I wouldn't say all people, but the people who are marginalized and who deserve the treatment of equity. So, you know, Mark Miller is just talking about um, very straightforwardly. Look, equity and equalities are very different. And what's embedded in equity is basically the three things. It's destructive, destructive interpretations. Destructive interpretations of laws or principles or goals or scientific data or any of those to strip the protection from the people who deserve to be protected. And I would say protected as in like empowering, we need to take care of you, but there's a, like a fact that historically, there has been a lot of destructive interpretations has been taking the rights away from the people who deserve it. And she also say that equity is defend equal protection of the law and advanced systemic changes. Uh, she's a lawyer, by the way. So it has to come to this, and, and it's very substantial. And I believe the point that she was making, it has to be substantial, and it has to be attainable. And then I just skip the one more thing. Is, I don't skip it, it's now there. Ensure the dignity of each individual and overcome historic and ongoing barriers due to stereotypes like isms. And I'm talking about racism. Don't jump, <laughs> right? And, and um, and compounding exclusions and degradations. So she's really talking about equity is to reverse the power imbalance, equity is protect access and the rights, and then equity is respect the dignity. 
It's potentially more than what we can measure, but we can certainly feel it. So it's real. So drawing from that, our Ocean Nexus group uh, came up with this wonderful uh, 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 quote. Uh, it's actually not true. It's just we have to build this beforehand. Um, ocean equity, and it's just a made up word, but if you can use it, that'd be great. Ocean equity is a concept to dismantle systemic inequity through the governance of the oceans. Let's dismantle systemic inequity. We've seen it everywhere. We've seen it in destructive interpretations. We've seen it people taking away their rights. We've seen it people taking away with access. We've seen the narratives which actually pushes certain people's interests, not everyone, not certainly people who deserve it. Let's really dismantle it because it's urgent. We all can think about equitable approach, but while we're thinking about spending another five to 10 years thinking about what's the best approach, there's things going on. And why don't we work against inequity so that people are actually in the face of inequity can be benefited from the work we do, which potentially a bit part sometimes, and I feel it every day, and I'm sure you do. So, I'm gonna propose, I'm gonna do it, right? I'm gonna propose a very simple diagram I came up with. And it's very, very simple. And it's not everything about equity, but we, this is an intellectual foundation of ocean equity. This mental inequity, what are you talking about, you know? How do we do it? There has been a people who's been doing it. If you come to you know, say this, I mean, you can see critical race theory, the people have been working on it. Feminist theory, people have been working on it. Decolonization, colonial studies and the perspectives, people have been working on it. We are in oceans and we connect it through your interest in oceans, but we also connect it as a human, as a people who are living on the planet Earth, which is not in a great state at the moment, but yet there has been a track record of people fighting it and studying and working on it. So why? don't we actually work together? You know, we don't have to be an expert about it, but there's a hint. So, this is what I propose. Ocean equity, and it, it's a double negative, so be careful about it. Ocean equity has to be anti or anti-inequity. It goes against inequity. So that's really in the simplest format. That's what it is. Today I have uh, my colleagues talking about the situation right now and you know the, the MPAs and the the practice to the discourse to the narrative over the implementations and you know everybody wants to be anti in equity. Everybody wants to do equitable practices, equitable policy, equitable consideration. How are we gonna do it? Let's recognize where we are now. And recognize where we are now from the perspective of against inequity. And by the way, one of the key things about tackling against inequity is, do you know, it's been like a shame and judgment and fear and ocean and everywhere it shouldn't be. But like, oh, you don't protect the ocean, shameful. It looks like there's just so many are you in the ocean, it's like we're making a judgment. Oh, enforcement, push the fear. I don't think it works. I don't think it's the way if you want to believe in equity. I think compassion would be good. I really do. So, no shame, no judgment, no fear. I'm just hoping our session will be full of compassion, <laughs> listen to each other, why are you funny? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not usually like that, am I? <laughs> so, there you go, uh, welcome panelists. and. Thank you everyone for being and coming to this panel and I hope you're gonna enjoy it. Thank you. This is a great introduction to sort of the thinking of how uh, folks here in the Nexus group, um, how we think about equity and how we all really share the different examples that we worked on to... Uh, there is, there you go. Okay, there we go. Um, so our next speaker, Dr. Cindy Scott, she's the director of the, of the School for Field Studies in Bocas del Toro, Panama, and she's going to give us a case study of uh, Bocas. Go ahead.
Thank you so much uh, to the organizers for having me here today. Thank you to Yoshi for this wonderful opportunity. And today I'm all about no fear. Um, and, and to just say thank you for leading without fear and for bringing to everyone's attention this important issue of equity. And today I'm going to talk to, with you a little bit about uh, what I've been able to uncover um, during my time in Bocas del Toro in Panama. Okay, so here's Panama. Um, that circle up there is where I live, and I've lived there for the last almost nine years. And it's an important region in Panama because it is a place where many people have migrated uh, over time, um, not just from the building of the Panama Canal, uh, where you had uh, immigrants and, and workers coming in from Jamaica, Barbados, uh, China, Italy, from all over the world, and, and France to build the canal, but then also you have the legacy of the United Fruit Company, um, which is now Chiquita Banana, in the region uh, where we are in Bocas del Toro. And I say this because um, I think it's important to understand power balances, right? This is about power um, inequity. And I think it's very important to, to center that as we begin this conversation. Okay, so the Isla Bastimentos National Marine Park, or the IBNMP, was first established it, as the first marine park in Panama in 1988. It is about 14,000 hectares, of which almost 12 are marine. And it's outlined in the black dots, as you can see, and it has a very odd shape. Um, and when you talk to the people that were actually in the room when this was established, they just say, well, there were people there, so we didn't want to do anything there. And the shape is what it is. It was just kind of willy-nilly. And... Um, that has some um, social conflict manifestations uh, that are present to this day, and I'll get into some of that. But before I do that, I do, as a marine biologist, um, want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of habitat complexity, because this is also a missing part that I think isn't really discussed and is critical when we really start to look at how um, marine protected areas are, are designed and implemented. So, Habitat complexity, you can, and I do with my students, as pictured here, you can go out into any region. Um, in Bocas, we do this in the mangroves, where we look at mangrove habitat complexity, and we can uh, generate what's called a habitat assessment score. And that includes all of these different characteristics, including rugosity, height, refuge size, percent live cover uh, of coral and hard substratum. And um, you can then take all those scores from around the archipelago and do a simple ANOVA, and that's what we did. We looked at um, areas close to anthropogenic influence, areas within the marine protected area, and areas far away, and what we discovered is that habitat complexity is actually not statistically significantly different between the IBM and, and, and P, uh, the marine park, and anthropogenically disturbed areas. That is problematic because um, what are we actually protecting? If we're not protecting the most complex habitats um, that support the greatest biodiversity, what are we actually doing? Except for annoying fishermen who cannot fish in the protected area, right? And so um, this got me thinking about a whole bunch of different things. And as a marine biologist, you know, we're not trained to think in social science at all. Uh, there, there's no intersection there. <laughs> and luckily then, <laughs> I met Yoshi, who said, yes, yes there is. Okay, so, <laughs> and firstly, I, I'm, a, I'm a diehard mangrove nerd. I love mangroves, they're magnificent. 50% of mangroves on the Caribbean coast of Panama make their home in Bocas del Toro. They are important for carbon sequestration, they're important for protection of coastlines, they're important for juvenile fish habitats, and they're important for supporting biodiversity between seagrass beds, coral reefs, and, and mangroves, of course. But they're under threat in Bocas. From what? We have unregulated tourism and development, major mangrove um, habitat loss. We have a lack of enforcement of the marine protected area, essentially rendering it as a paper park. Um, we, five minutes. Um, we have surrounding communities that are not well informed of policies, and we have communities that are skeptical of government entities. So recently, I was flying out of Bogus, and I saw this. How on earth is it possible that close to the marine protected area, it's not technically within it, 
Are we allowing this level of development to occur? What is happening? Mangroves are protected, and yet here we are. And we also have people moving in, trying to build their idea of what paradise is. Remove the mangroves and make a nice pristine beach, right? And so one of my students made this map, and um, you can see where there has been mangrove loss since 1996 throughout the um, Almirante, I'm sorry, the um, yeah, Bahia Almirante on the south side of Sol uh, Solarte Island. And so this question comes up over and over again. Who is actually really benefiting from this marine protected area? And we know that we have social conflict manifestations in Bocas del Toro, as mentioned in this paper. Um, you have feelings of exclusion. You have um, inequities in the distribution of the benefits. Um, and as we begin to think, how can we sort of restructure this marine protected area, because this is on the lips of, of many um, government authorities, the answer is, well, maybe we should talk to the people who actually live there, <laughs> no? And so that's exactly what I set out to do after thinking about, as a marine biologist, I have to do better. I can't just sit in my lab. I, I've got to talk to people. OK, so that's exactly what I set out to do with a group of students. We wanted to determine stakeholder we wanted to determine stakeholder differences in mangrove valuation, looking at uh, or through the qualitative assessment of social and cultural ecosystem services. And so we looked at three different groups in the region. We did semi-structured interviews to indigenous locals, non-indigenous locals, and lifestyle migrants, those with the capital and the economic resources, to move from other countries and establish themselves in Bocas del Toro. Okay. And so this is where we interview people throughout the area. I'm sort of speeding through this because of time. Okay. It's okay? Okay, okay. And I just wanted to flash before you this um, sort of fused framework that we use to uncover some of the inequities that we see in um, mangrove cultural ecosystem services throughout the region. And I wanted to just very briefly mention that we included the equity power piece because of the history, because of the people that have come into that particular region, I think it's really important to include. And so what were our findings? Well, in speaking to over 30 people in the region, we found that mental health um, was really important in terms of the way that people value um, mangroves. They go there for peace. They go there for calm. They go there for serenity. And um, one indigenous local person said, when mangroves are being cut or removed, it scares away the animals that we love to see, and that bring us peace like sloths. Also, when someone cuts an area, we feel like we can't go there anymore, like it's no longer our place, but claimed. Plus, there are no longer any fish there, so I guess we don't have a reason to visit places that were important to us once they have been cut. Another finding was that of identity. So we asked every participant, what would Bocas be like without mangroves? And it was just unfathomable, because mangroves are such a huge part of identity in the region. No one's asked me this before. I think first I'd be very angry because I would want to know what happened. I would feel like they stole something from me. I know it doesn't belong to me, but I feel like it is a part of me. And so I'd be very angry because I grew up here with these places. And our third finding, of course, was the uncovering of in, um, inequities in mangrove governance where those with economic capital, those who are able to remove mangroves and pay later, um, basically can do as they please. But if you are indigenous or even a non-indigenous local person, you know, there's supposed to be this law that protects, right? But those who have are able to remove and those who don't cannot. And we also uncovered anti-indigenous um, sentiments and quite frankly, this racist statement, I think, um, sort of uncovers the way that people who've moved into the region view um, indigenous people. And this has to stop, because we, can, we can't move forward, right, if this is still happening. And so to conclude that portion, um, it really supports the need for us to understand the subgroup and ethno-racial understandings of mangrove cultural ecosystem services, and that we know that there's sort of this really complex relationship between inequity and people's appreciation for mangrove environments. And that all stems from this history of all the people that have moved there. And 
just very quickly, I recently was invited to sit at a meeting where the Ministry of Environment decided to unveil the 30 by 30 movement to people in Bocas del Toro, even though this happened about a year ago where Panama reached the 30% by 2030, but the people of Bocas del Toro, mind you, the poorest province in the nation, um, were not informed. And this is how they felt. And I translated this um, from some of the members that were present in the room. And while, yes, it's a good thing that people were there, um, the, the problem is that there's still this distrust between local people and the government, and it's real. And so there's a mismatch, right? There's a, there's a great inequity happening where you have this huge movement, but local people aren't being included and they're being left behind, and it's real. So um, when people were asked what they'd like to see improve, um, for parks in the region, people said, we want to see eco ecological tourism, protection of mangroves, we want to see park guard education, we want to see national analysis of the efficacy. Because we know the MPA in Bogus del Toro is basically ineffective, right? And they wanted to see let go, corruption, felling of trees without control, poor use of funds, unsustainable tourism, solid waste that isn't recyclable, exclusion of island communities, poor use of intersectional local funds and bureaucracy. So many people just feel left out still. And are we still just repeating what happened in 1988? The exclusion of local people in the planning, in the, in the entire process, in the entire process. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you. I thank Ocean Nexus. I thank everyone in the room for being here and being open to these ideas. And um, I'll talk later. <laughs> Um, this is a great example of approaches we can use to really understand the implications, um, as well as some of the solutions, right? I mean, I think the local people themselves provide some of the solutions and pathways that we can, um, that we can use. Thank you. So our next speaker is Constance from Board. She's the PhD candidate from Anchors at the University of Wollongong, and we'll be talking about large-scale marine protected areas in everyone, thanks for being here. Thanks to Yoshi for leading this Don't team. Uh, really, um, <laughs> I'm glad that there's there's more conversation about this really important topic, and it's really great to see um, to see this kind of consortium of research focusing on this. Um, so I am a PhD student, uh, like Anna said. I'm, um, it's very much a research in progress. I'm in my second year of my PhD. Uh, I'm based at the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security, which is hosted within the University of Wollongong, Australia. Um, and today's talk is going to be about sharing some insights and really trying to provoke some thinking about assumptions and narratives um, around large-scale marine protected areas established in overseas territories and how does that relate to the history and ongoing colonialism and conservation. Um, perhaps whilst I still have your utmost attention, I'll just um, check a quick sort of terminology uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page about what I mean about overseas territories. Um, no, there's no international law definition um, about overseas territories, um, and it encapsulates a very wide diversity of territories, but for the purpose of this research, I interpret it quite widely, it's just any territories that's been formally colonized and remains non-self-governing, or is self-governing, uh, self, um, but in ways other than independence. So we're still um, legally and institutionally uh, dependent on their ex-colonizer or metropolitan state. So just to start with just a little bit of background about um, large-scale marine protected areas, or LSMPAs. Um, here, what I consider as an LSMPA are uh, really vast um, chunks of oceans of 100,000 square kilometers of greater. Um, and really what we've seen at the forefront of 21st century marine conservation is an explosion of MPA, of large-scale MPAs um, at the surface of the globe, so much so that um, about 72%, I think it's even more now, actually 75% of the global um, MPA coverage is um, encapsulated by about 36 LSMPAs in the world. Um, and this has really been pushed by um, international conservation agenda, this pushing for quantitative targets 
um, which has been starting with SDGs, and then followed on with um, the concept of conventional biodiversity framework with IT targets um, of 10 percent, which aim for 10 percent coastal and marine protection um, by 2020, and of course, very recently with the adoption of the 30 by 30 framework. Um, and so these targets essentially create very strong political incentives to create vast um, marine protected areas in greater numbers. Um, and this has been sometimes criticized as, are we doing a race for quantity of equality? Um, and that's relevant in the equity space as well. Um, and implementing such large MPAs doesn't come with its own challenges, and in fact, there's still debates going on as to the conservation um, outcomes and benefits uh, that these LSMPs can provide, knowing that they're located in offshore, really remote areas, um, and as to the socio-economic impacts that they can have as well. Um, they come with great economic costs in terms of implementation, management, enforcement, and monitoring, obviously, um, and this. But they also bring up the question as to what's the impact on people. It's not because they're necessarily far further from shore that they have these consequences on local populations and, and communities that live on the shorelines next to them. Um, and so that brings in equity concerns. And some ongoing and um, historical equity concerns in conservation relates to colonialism. Um, and this has been traditionally mostly studies in terrestrial conservation. Um, and recently, there's a terminology that's come up called green colonialism, um, which really studied how historically in land-based conservation, particularly in African parks, um, there's really a, a, he a direct heritage of colonialism in the ENGOs um, managed parks and actually practice fortress conservation, segregating people from nature, which is really the resulting um, outcome of a Western mindset. Uh, which kind of sees us as a dichotomy between humans and, and the environment. Um, and this has come as great cost and sometimes even human rights costs. Um, and slowly um, but surely we're starting to see these conversations coming up in the marine space as well. Um, but with this sort of colonial heritage, we've seen um, top-down governance um, happening in uh, MPAs and LSMPAs, and of course the use of parachute science or colonial science, uh, again using sort of an extractive methods of, um, of science uh, without acknowledging or without integrating local indigenous knowledge as much as it should, um, and, and again using, in a sense, these um, this spaces, um, and not necessarily for the good reasons and for the people that actually need it. Um, so whilst there's more uh, kind of momentum uh, in these conversations uh, in marine conservation space, there's still the LSMPAs, perhaps due to the size, perhaps due to the novelty, the remoteness, tend to still be <coughs> lagging behind in terms of studying the relationships between them and, um, and uh, colonialism. And that's particularly true uh, when you look at um, overseas territories. Um, now, why, why am I talking about territories? Why does it matter? Um, because when you look at this map here, you can see all of the very um, largest MPAs in the world. So all the ones that are 100,000 square kilometers more. And all the ones that are in red are the ones in overseas territories. Um, that's a lot. Eight out of the ten largest MPAs in the world are located in overseas territories. And yet, unless some people in the room are from territories, you've probably never heard from them. Um, why don't we talk more about them? Why, where are the people from the territories represented in science or in policy or in governance? Why don't we talk more about them when they're really obviously key ocean stakeholders and conservation stakeholders? Um, you can even see here that actually this trend is even more obvious when you look at the fully highly protected areas that tend to be even more represented in, um, in that ratio. So this triggered my questions as to, well, how do we explain the trends? Is this about conservation? Is this about geopolitics? Or is it about both? Um, one thing's for certain is that establishing these large-scale marine protected areas in these territories specifically comes at a reduced political cost comparatively to establishing it in the 
mainland or metropolitan state um, where you have more stakeholders' interests, more voting power, these, um, these territories are very far away a lot of the times from uh, the metropolitan states um, and not a lot of people even know about them in the mainland. Um, it's also a great way to secure geostrategic assets and spheres of influence in this marine space. Um, and in some particular historical context, um, in these territories, there's still ongoing um, self-determination processes and struggles that are still going on, and this is a great way to reset your sovereignty over this space. Um, and of course, there's a question as well as to, well, is this also coming as a trade-off for comparatively very low efforts of conservation in the metropolitan space? And I think this goes back to the question that's been raised before is to, well, who gets to benefit from this conservation and who gets to bear the burden? Um, so I'm trying to look at these um, issues using a framework that I'm, that's under construction, which I call blue colonialism, um, which can roughly be um, described as a form of ocean governance practiced by those metropolitan states in the overseas territories and really using marine conservation almost as a shield um, and as a tool to achieve geopolitical targets. Um, and some key features of this, um, of this framework would be, well, the political expediency that allows them, um, the practice of top-down governance, and importantly, the reduced visibility of stakeholders. And what I mean stakeholders, it goes from local communities, indigenous communities, but also territories themselves as entities, um, because they are not, even though they might not be independent, we also cannot associate them um, entirely to the metropolitan state. Um, and so these key features, um, risk to perpetuate inequities, obviously inherited from um, colonial legacies. Um, so just as a sort of take home message, um, it's really important to give more of a um, stage for overseas territories. If, if there's such important um, ocean stakeholders, France's EEZ is 97% um, due to its overseas territories. The UK, 89%. Why don't we talk about them? Um, there, there's obvious controversies around the geopolitical incentives behind the creation of LSMPAs in overseas territories. Um, and that raises conflicts and equity concerns that really need to be addressed, um, particularly in territories where self-determination um, struggles and, and ongoing struggles are still going on. Um, in order to make sure that we don't perpetuate or even create a new form of, of colonialism. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for the great presentations thus far uh, leading up to this. Um, um, I'm in a more interesting spot for myself because I don't often do local uh, research, but I do a lot of work on um, impact assessment. And I've been working with Yoshi and others in Ocean Nexus Center about how to think about how, do, how can we put together a framework or an assessment tool to help prospectively plan for equity in terms of uh, addressing um, and, and contributing to this idea of inequities, and how can we monitor uh, ongoing projects so that we can we can have ocean interventions that promote equity. So some of this thinking started actually back in the in the oh, both yes see I already got messed up. Um, and I have animations too, so this is going to be this is going to be a challenge. Uh, starting from the Near East days, what, what uh, Yoshi brought up earlier, pre Nexus, we we when we were thinking about predicting um, future oceans. One of the projects was looking at the Sustainable Development Goals. And what happens when you address uh, ocean SDGs, um, what are consequences across the SDGs place? So this is essentially kind of a matrix looking on the, uh, on the rows here. These are the different Sustainable Development Goal targets for the oceans. And then here is you know, the, the, the main Sustainable Development Goals altogether. And um, basically it's what happens if you progress or achieve these? What happens across? And so um, some of our results are shown in these kind of pie diagrams. Where you see more blue, that means you see more progress towards the SDGs. Where you see more red, you see potential trade-offs. So ways that progressing oceans can actually 
move against some of these uh, SDG goals. And when we released this, people loved it because they saw so much blue. But they neglected the red. <laughs> and the red is, there's less of it, but you don't want to confuse frequency with importance. Okay, so um, there are important areas where the red shows up. And they're basically all equity areas. Poverty, gender, um, uh, SDG 10, which is about uh, reducing inequalities, peace, justice, good governance. Um, interestingly, you see the most red from the protected areas. We <laughs> won't jump into that necessarily, um, um, but it gives us a sense that there are potential trade-offs here and we need to plan for them. Okay? Um, the other aspect uh, that I think really, really jump-started some of this work on, on thinking about these toolkits and frameworks is that there's a lot of attention on um, interventions, oceanist interventions, to promote sustainable development that largely come from environmental and economic planning. So uh, environmental protection like MPAs, restoration initiatives, uh, ecotourism, fisheries, offshore energy developments. A lot of these come from uh, um, thinking that oceans are a space to grow the economy, Oceans are, are a place to um, protect nature. But increasingly they get also sold as spaces to promote how people benefit, how, how it promotes inequity. These initiatives were never initially planned for, inequity, for equity issues. And um, uh, a recent product from Ocean, Ocean Nexus, which is to think about uh, general strategies Towards, um, towards equity in the oceans, do you start from environmental, do you start from economic, do you start from uh, societal interventions, um, and what are the consequences? And one of the results from our work was showing that um, there's relatively few cases where you kind of start from social foundations and go upwards, but that in some cases show the most promise. And all the other areas where you start from either nature conservation uh, or economic development, um, there's some chances for blowback well, that, that promote inequities. And finally, there's this report that came out not, a lot, not too long ago uh, from the UN talking about all these plans towards net zero when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. And there's a report that really slammed the idea of greenwashing. There's a lot of promise that goes off for any kind of development or conservation plan that do not get realized. And we are very concerned about equity washing. So we want to have plans to prevent equity washing. Okay? Let's have some accountability in, uh, in what, we, what we think we're going to contribute to. So there is a need for robust equity tools. Um, because a lot of the interventions, as I said, they're not designed for equity. So if we're going to be promising it, we have to also acknowledge that sometimes things can go not as planned. Okay? In, in, um, our intentions may not be enough. And a lot of the indicators that, 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 uh, that are around already for uh, thinking about equity are not necessarily reliable. A lot of them neglect processes and outcomes. A lot of them neglect social cultural context, so we had some presentations about the importance of considering long history. There's often lack of transparency, conflicts of interest, who's actually doing the measurement, et cetera. Okay, so what, we, what we're thinking about is more of a procedural tool. That kind of starts from thinking about first understanding the sociological context that's, that, that, that we're living in. There's always processes that are promoting inequities, and then thinking through the design and implementation um, of any intervention towards the outcome. So you want to think about any kind of intervention from design all the way to the outcome, acknowledging that what happens at early stages can actually go throughout the, um, the, the, um, the, throughout the intervention, that there, are, there is this kind of path dependency. And you want to think about it from, a, from an equity standpoint through kind of a common tripartite uh, 
framework of equity, thinking about the recognitional side, so um, who's involved, who's, who matters, whose values are of interest, whose way of thinking uh, contributes procedural, so are the, the, the rules, regulations fair to everyone, distributional, who faces the risks, uh, who benefits from any kind of intervention. And we want it to be um, iterative. So a lot of this kind of follows from some uh, impact assessment kind of uh, ways of thinking in that we want to identify adverse effects in these stages so we can plan against them. Can we imagine any kind of intervention, negative impacts that come through this process so that we can plan against them later? Okay, so we're gonna run through kind of a quick case study of using this kind of tool um, in Madagascar. So in Madagascar, there are marine protected areas that, that um, have been established, planned established, um, in some cases following what's called a population health environment program. So these are programs that are trying to address biodiversity and resource scarcity and health issues uh, driven by resource scarcity concerns often rela related to human population. So the underlying idea is that humans reproduce too much, that reduces underlying resources, and that's a big problem and it affects the uh, underlying ecosystem. Um, the context of Madagascar is uh, quite complex. Uh, under old French colonial control, they actually established pro-natalist policies that encouraged people to have more kids under colonial control to, to increase economic output. Um, so uh, the problem is not their own making, necessarily. Um, a lot of fishing regulations uh, often affect women more than men because they have less access to uh, tools to, to harvest marine resources. Um, and they often have more kind of gleaning, especially when it comes to like octopus fisheries. And traditional what's called Dina knowledge systems are often discredited for Western science. But these Dina knowledge systems historically helped contribute to local resource management. Um, and the Blue Ventures Safari project was really a population health environment kind of program based around family planning and environmental protection. You, you want to address both at the same time, really focused on reducing high fertility rates, and um, uh, it was acknowledged that a lot of marine, uh, marine resource issues came about after uh, commercial fisheries were introduced, um, but you want to, they essentially are addressing these resource declines through local communities. So it's acknowledged that uh, commercial fishing is, is a problem, but through MPAs we can reduce resource use through reducing local uh, resource use. So a bit of a mismatch there. So there's definite consequences for SDG 5 on gender equality and for SDG 10 on re reduced inequalities. So if we go through this kind of framework, what, what happened with the Safety project? First it was um, kind of top-down planned around MPAs selected in poor and vulnerable communities. Um, so it was a bit of an imposition. Um, the, 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 the Dina knowledge systems were highly discredited in favor of more Western knowledge systems. Uh, women were not really part of leadership boards. Um, and uh, at the same time, the SAPI program is really focused on the vulnerability of, of, of women, the sense that um, uh, if you want to reduce fertility, you have to target women, but they also had no input in decision making. <coughs> um, by kind of discrediting traditional laws that promoted sustainability historically, um, you have impacts on kind of future cultural transmission, um, um, and the fish closer date, dates that were chosen more negatively impacted women uh, because it didn't allow them to fish, but allowed men to fish. Um, and uh, nothing was really done to affect wider impacts that were brought in by commercial fisheries. All of this at the same time, where women were becoming responsible more for the family planning and protecting environments simultaneously. Okay. So there's 
terms of the outcomes of the project, there's potential negative impacts to the cultural transmission, as I mentioned. Um, sovereignty remains within the NGO rather than the local community. And women um, were potentially looking at the project as more and more illegitimate. Uh, finally, it's essentially it's poor communities who are holding the burden for resource protection. Um, and I mean, this really did uh, inherently reproduce racism, kind of classist ideals, um, which ultimately can lead to negative social impacts and questions about the legitimacy of the whole program. So really quickly, um, most notion interventions are not designed for equity. We really need a tool to aid in the planning and monitoring of equity. Um, and it's worth having this kind of procedural approach to both prospectively plan for so you can, you can essentially look into the future and consider what could go wrong, but also look back and say what happened and so we can iteratively plan. And for the Blue Ventures projects, you can definitely get cases where you can hit what you intend to hit and still have negative outcomes. And you want to try to prevent that from happening again. Um, I should also say that I, before this, I was chatting with the Tosa uh, Rakotun Brzafi about, about this um, to say that this is a particular case in Madagascar, and there are LM MMAs that you know, are planned differently, and it's worth thinking about how that has developed somewhat in response to this to kind of keep, keep help developing this, this framework and tool. Um, I'm really excited to, to do that, and that's it for me. Bodwich. I'm a Nexus Fellow. I'm based at Dalhousie University, uh, and uh, I work closely with Megan Bailey. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about my work on blue sovereignty and marine conservation, lessons from New Zealand. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm non-Indigenous. My family's from New Zealand. As a non-Indigenous academic, uh, one of the privileges I have is being able to choose which projects I'm a part of and which I'm not, and moving in and out of these spaces. Uh, that's not the case for many people, including some of the folks whose, whose experiences I'll be talking about here. Uh, I want to also acknowledge that I'm one voice among many, and that other perspectives are also important uh, to listen to. Uh, so that being said, I want to start by highlighting a contradiction that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Uh, indigenous people are increasingly valued for their ability to govern marine environments. Governments have recognized indigenous rights, UNDRIP being a classic example of that. Uh, but indigenous groups remain excluded from science and policy making uh, in many contexts. And despite New Zealand being upheld as a model for uh, indigenous rights recognition initiatives, uh, Maori Fisher's experiences, some of which I'll talk about here, illustrate this contradiction. This raises questions. Uh, how do we support indigenous sovereignty in marine science and policy? Uh, and I'm thinking here of sovereignty as the authority to govern resource use and trade. I'm happy to other inter open to other interpretations as well. So a little background on New Zealand. Uh, over the past 40 years, the New Zealand government has negotiated treaty settlements with Maori. In settlements, Maori have obtained assets and governance rights. Included in those governance rights are rights to implement customary uh, fisheries management areas, which are outlined in the, the map uh, 
I was sure what else to it to see that big of a deal. But, uh, so some of the customary, the two primary forms of customary uh, governance for marine space are called matai tai and taiapuri. Uh, matai tai uh, and taiapuri allow for indigenous-led coastal governance. In a matai tai, commercial fishing pressure is usually prohibited. In a, in a Thai prairie, all types of fishing may be allowed. These exist as alternatives to MPAs. Uh, however, Maori groups have faced challenges in their attempts to implement them. Uh, so briefly here, I will overview why alternatives to MPAs are needed challenges based in attempts to implement Matai Tai and Tai Puri, and strategies to overcome these challenges. Uh, so why alternatives to MPAs are needed? I started working with Maori fishers in 2015, and one of the first fishers I met was Perry Tainui. And at the time, Perry was extremely frustrated with the implementation of a marine reserve in the Akaroa Harbor in the South Island of New Zealand, uh, right at the mouth of the traditional territory of uh, Perry's sub-tribe of Runana. Implementation of this marine reserve uh, encompassed his territory, the Onuku territory of Zurnanga, uh, and it held, in Perry's view, pretty profound implications for local economic development opportunities, food sovereignty, and knowledge transfer. Uh, in Perry's view, he wanted to see his marae, or his customary meeting space, uh, pictured up here, as being a site where visitors could come and eat food that was caught locally. With the establishment of the marine protected area, local fishers had to go out of the harbor risking, risk, risking uh, their, their well-being in deeper waters uh, to fish. And this was a problem for less well-resourced fishers who didn't have bigger boats to access offshore areas. Uh, the implementation of the marine reserve also made the traditional reseeding practices uh, for sedentary species, so selfish populations, that uh, folks in his room I used to participate in uh, illegal, right? So this idea was to move uh, power or abalone from one area to another to try to regenerate these beds. Uh, in addition to taking power out of sites where uh, power was stunted, they weren't growing big enough, and thinning out these beds. Uh, implementation of the marine reserve made such translocation practices uh, no longer permissible uh, and prohibited the transfer of knowledge and the evaluation of the effect of, this, of these techniques uh, between generations and going forward. Uh, so in short, MPA establishment at Akaroa disproportionately affected less well-resourced fishers, limited options for food sovereignty, and presented barriers to indigenous knowledge transfer. The violence of the Akaroa Marine Reserve is tied to the permanency of restricted fishery access. Once the MPA is in place, it's very difficult to go back and then allow for these power receiving initiatives to happen or allow for local fishers to fish uh, in, in their traditional territories. Matai Tai and Tai Puri, these customary protected areas, on the other hand, allow for adaptive fishery management initiatives. So you might place a ban on commercial fishing for five years and then reinstate the option to do it later. However, there's been implementation challenges. Even though this policy exists where Maori can apply for a customary permit 
applications. The approval process is challenged in that you have to have approval from the central government uh, who face disincentives, usually push back from the commercial fishing industry to allow for indigenous-led governance. There's also challenges associated with enforcement. Maori have limited authority to enforce policies. This authority is maintained uh, at the state level. So our groups have employed some strategies to overcome these challenges. Uh, political barriers to implementation have been addressed through collaboration with commercial fishers. Uh, these collaborations have involved gifts and gains approaches where, you know, we'll give you some of what you want and you can take some of what I want. Uh, a great example of this is the Kaikoura Marine Sanctuary in the South Island, which I'm happy to talk about further. Uh, limited enforcement authorities have been addressed in part or attempted to address uh, through community-based education initiatives. Uh, so one of these initiatives has been through been uh, an example where wooden figurines called Po have been placed along harbors where new regulations have been implemented. And the idea behind these figurines is that folks who are in the area will ask other people what they need. And this will kind of result in some sort of uh, community-based uh, discussion of what's happening and social sanctioning for those who choose not to comply. Uh, the need for this approach was described to me as arising in part between two failed initiatives to communicate the strategies of uh, the new management policies initially. Uh, the first initiative was, uh, you know, what you might typically see was posting signs up around the harbor, uh, saying in this case, you know, fishing pressure isn't gonna be allowed for X amount of time. Uh, and the original signs had the Department of Fisheries logo, the central government logo on this, right? So you need authorization from the central government. These signs were defaced, defeated, <laughs> within a week. <laughs> Round two, same idea, similar, you know, uh, but the signs are a bit more artistic this time, and this time they had the tribe's logo on it. Uh, apparently they lasted about a month before also being faced. <laughs> uh, so this third option was, uh, you know, an attempt to overcome these, uh, I guess, resistive messengers that took place associated with the first two. Um, and again, thinking about how uh, discussions with others kind of maybe facilitate different incentives for compliance. Both of these examples or both of these strategies to overcome barriers have been achieved or uh, adopted through substantial amount of resources uh, invested by those on the ground, right? And those are often volunteer positions, folks who care about these these areas uh, and and want to see them, you know, do well. Uh, but they were, yeah, they require a lot of resources, and that's something to consider when we think about policy implications going forward. Perry's story tells us some uh, things to consider, criterion to consider when we're thinking about. Uh, evaluating existing or proposed MPAs. We want to think about any disproportionate effects restricted fishery access will have on less well-resourced fishers, right, and the associated implications for uh, you know, equity from that. Uh, we want to think about effects on food sovereignty, you know, who's able to access uh, culturally appropriate foods and implications for the transfer of indigenous knowledge, especially related to uh, you know, re-restoration efforts that might be uh, difficult to, to implement under restricted uh, fish take regulations. Efforts to advance indigenous-led marine governance should include mechanisms to overcome political and administrative hurdles associated with implementation, um, resources to tribes, uh, and funds for community-based enforcement and monitoring. 
Uh, again, I'm happy to talk about this work further with anyone who's interested. Uh, I've had a lot of support in this work, uh, including from the Nippon Foundation, <laughs> uh, the Ocean Nexus Center, and also uh, the Naitahu Research Center at the University of Canterbury. 